Thank you. So this is uh, uh, the result of a large-scale analysis we performed on the web to analyze the effectiveness of content security policy in the wild. This is joint work with uh, Alvise Rabitti and Michele Bugliesi at Università Ca' Foscari Venezia. So what is content security policy, or CSP for short? It's a double free standard which is used to protect uh, web application against content injection. So at its core, it's uh, a policy language which can be used to define content restriction using whitelist. So the idea roughly is that you can specify for different content types which are the uh, available origins you really want to load contents from. And by default, uh, CSP puts some security restrictions like stopping inline scripts and styles because they're dangerous. They can be injected by an attacker on your own page. And also to stop some dangerous functions like eval, which can be used to transform strings into code. And uh, if you really want to relax this restriction, you can do it, but you have to do it explicitly. So you must explicitly run out to security if you want. And CSP can be deployed in two modes. We have the enforcement mode, where all the content restrictions are actually enforced by your browser. And we have the report-only mode, where no content restriction is enforced, but just the browser keeps track of the security violation with respect to your policy and sends this uh, violation to some uh, URI. So you can check this violation and monitor the policy before deploying it so that you can test the policy without breaking your own website. CSP is a very nice uh, standard to me. Uh, it doesn't substitute proper input sanitization. So you, sh you, still you should still sanitize your input to avoid content injection on your own web pages. But it's a very good defense in depth. So if some content injection happens, you can still be protected by your browser. That's the idea. An example. So we have one policy, which is deployed at supersecure.com. And let's assume this policy is submitted uh, over HTTPS. This policy says that you can load the scripts from any subdomain on Facebook.net using the HTTPS protocol, while for all the other content types, like images, styles, uh, whatever, you can only load this content from the, the very same uh, place deploying the policy. So you can only load the content from uh, HTTPS supersecure.com. So in this case, we have some allowed behavior, which is possibility of load, including scripts from uh, uh, HTTPS connect.facebook.net. While we can load, for instance, images of all styles only from supersecure.com using HTTPS protocol. While instead, we have some example of blocked behavior by the content security policy in the example. We cannot load scripts from evil.com, for instance, or we cannot lo load the images even from supersecure.com if we use the HTTP protocol, because we're deploying the policy over HTTPS. And uh, as I mentioned, by default, the policy stops the execution of inline scripts. A little bit more about inline scripts. Since they're pervasive and uh, hard to remove on the web, despite their dangers, it is possible in CSP to simplify deployment to uh, allow some inline script ex execution. In the original version of the standard, CSP 1.0, there was this keyword, which is uh, unsafe in line. And you could activate the keyword to say that any inline script is allowed to be executed. This way, you're announced to a lot of security, which is offered by CSP, because you're open the room for script injection attacks. But it was meant to simplify deployment. Luckily, in uh, CSP level two, we have some other uh, more controlled way to whitelist individual inline elements. For instance, we can use hashes and nonces. You can see uh, in this directive here that uh, there is this nonce keyword with a random nonce. And the idea is that uh, only the script uh, tags with the correct non nonce attribute according to the policy can be actually be executed. So if the attacker doesn't know the nonce, he will be able still to inject a script, but the script will not run because it will lack the proper nonce. So this is the way to, uh, let's say, simplify the deployment without sacrificing too much security which pro was proposed in the most more recent version of the standard. In our paper, we wanted to analyze the effectiveness of CSP in the current web. We tackled four different research questions. First question is whether major browsers implement CSP correctly, because if the implementation of CSP in browsers is not correct, you may have policies which are actually weaker than expected, for instance. Then we want to understand 
whether uh, the, the CSP deployment is actually large enough, so whether websites are actually using CSP or not. And uh, if so, we want to understand whether the current policies are accurate and secure. By secure, I mean policies provide a minimum level of protection, for instance, against uh, cross-site scripting attacks. And by accurate, I mean that the policy is tailored so that it doesn't break the website. So a good policy should not stop a legitimate website functionality. And this is what I mean by accurate. And finally, the last question we target in the paper is understanding a little bit how the deployment of CSP is evolving over time. So we want to understand whether uh, more people are using CSP uh, over time and also whether existing policies are improving over time. So whether they're made more secure or they, if they're relaxed because, for instance, they, bre they break functionality. So there is this trade-off between security and uh, compatibility that we want to understand. So let me start with the first point of our investigation, so browser support for CSP. We develop a, test of, a set of test pages to test the CSP specification uh, against real browsers. And what we did, for instance, was uh, writing a sort of corner cases or cases with a semantic which, which is not obvious. Like in the first policy here, you can see we have two script source directive. The first, which says that we can only load scripts from a.com, while the second one, which says we, we can only load scripts from b.com. And what the CCP specification says in this case is that only the first directive should be enforced. While in the second case, in the second policy, we have script source twitter.com. We are not specifying explicitly a protocol for Twitter in this case, and the semantics of this, according to the CSP specification, is that if we are deploying this policy over an HTTPS page, we are only whitelisting the HTTPS protocol, while if we deploy the very same policy over an HTTP page, we are actually whitelisting Twitter over both HTTP and HTTPS. And we develop a bunch of other cases we wanted to test to check whether browsers are compliant with respect to the specification. And uh, our analysis shows that the browsers have mostly good support for CSP, including the mobile variant of these browsers. But we, we found a, a dangerous bug in Microsoft Edge. And we also find a surprising behavior on, on LineScript, which is implemented in all major browsers. So let me comment on this. Let's start by discussing the bug of Microsoft Edge. And if you have a look at the CSP specification, you will see that if there are multiple policies on the same page, all the policies must be individually enforced. So in this example, I have two, two policies, P1 and P2. The first policy says that, which, uh, that I can load scripts from A.com and B.com, while the second policy says that only B.com is a valid source for script inclusion. So in this case, if I want to enforce both policies, as the specification says, uh, it is easy to understand that only B.com should be a valid source for script inclusion. Actually, it's like if I was intersecting the two policies, in a sense. But still, uh, we realize that this is not the case for Microsoft Edge, which instead allows script inclusion from A.com also. And the behavior is due to the fact that if we have conflicting uh, directive in different policies in Edge, the first directive is winning. So uh, you can actually prove that this behavior is more liberal than the one uh, prescribed by the specification. So this behavior may actually open room for attacks. Second strange behavior we found is about these two policies, which exemplify the problem pretty clearly. So we have one policy, P1, which says that we can only load the images from A.com, and there is no other restriction on all the other content types. So all the other content types can be loaded from everywhere on the, on the internet. In the second policy, we have something very similar, because we say we can only load the images from A.com, but all the other content can be loaded from everywhere. The difference is that we only say this explicitly because we have the default source directive, which applies to all the other content types. So we would expect, also according to the specification, that these two policies should be semantically equivalent. But what we observed in practice is that there is a difference in the treatment of inline scripts because only the second policy blocks inline scripts. And inline scripts are instead allowed by policy P1 even if no unsafe inline is present on the policy. And this was very surprising to us and unexpected according to the specification. And still we observe that all the browsers we tested behave like this. Uh, in a sense, this is not uh, a big issue overall. We reason about this. 
And we, we think that in the end, both policies are insecure because still P1 and P2 allow to load scripts from uh, evil.com. So this means in particular that if an attacker is, is able to inject content in the page, if you have either P1 or P2, the attacker doesn't really need to inject inline script. It can just inject a script tag, retrieve some attack from uh, her own website, and will be able to attack the website uh, just fine. So this is, uh, let's say, inconsistent with respect to the specification, but we don't think it's dangerous. Moving to the second research question we, we targeted, we wanted to understand uh, how is the current CSP deployment. So we crawled the likes out of million websites in March 2016, and we collected the CSP headers with the policies. And we found that uh, more than 8,000 8, websites are using uh, CSP, so it seems there is an increase with respect to a previous study of two years ago by a time factor, approximately. But if you look at this number more carefully, you will notice that the deployment is more limited than this because we have web development frameworks like Shopify, which have a major impact. For instance, uh, Shopify is the 42% more or less of all the policies we have uh, in, uh, in, the de in our data set. If we strip away all these, uh, let's say, uh, default policies from web development framework, we end up having only 3,000 websites, more or less, which actually enforce a content security policy, which leads us to the question of how many developers are really aware of the use of CSP on their own websites. We wanted to understand better what's going on on the 3,000 websites which actually enforce the policy, because for these websites, we are assuming a deliberate adoption of the standard. So we had a look at, the, at the, what was used in these policies, and we realized that uh, dangerous cons constructs are pervasive. More than a half of the website is using uh, unsafe in line, and uh, more than half of the website, again, is, is using unsafe eval, which is the counterpart for eval of unsafe in line. So it's a way to relax the security restriction and allow the, the execution of eval into your browser, despite the presence of, of a content security policy. And we notice that even if hashes and nonces are very promising, they're not very used in the wild because less than 3% of the website is using these features. Also, something which I find particularly worrisome is that there is not a robust monitoring of CSP in current websites. We found that only the 21% of the website is monitoring CSP violations. So this means that if there is any problem with the policy, because maybe the policy is stopping some functionality of your own website, this is undetected. And also, which I find particularly nice, is that we found even 94 websites which run CSP in report-only mode. So they're not actually enforcing any anything, but they don't even monitor violations. So this means that the policy they write is useless, because all the violations which are triggered in this case are only logged in the JavaScript console. So they, they lose uh, the, report, the reporting facilities of CSP. Also, a number which I find particularly interesting is that more than 21% of the websites which use CSP is not using CSP for content restriction. For instance, we found that uh, this significant share of websites is just using CSP for implementing frame busting, which is mostly orthogonal to content restriction. So I think this gives some preliminary evidence that the standard has not been very successful so far. And there is uh, more to say about this uh, if you really want to get a, a more in-depth understanding on the current CSP deployment, because you can really ask the question on what it means to configure CSP correctly. So we want to understand whether websites are writing policies which are fine, and we want to do it on a large scale. So in particular, we can just manually inspect all the websites and try to understand whether the policy is good or not for the website. But uh, we can define classes of error, which are uh, easy to catch, in a sense, and uh, automate the, this process so that uh, you can find attacks on many, many websites. So we define four classes of errors in our study. The first class is very simple. It's typos. For instance, in this policy, the developer wanted to specify a default source directive. But in fact, it, it specified it incorrectly because he wrote default source. And browsers are very tolerant to this for backward compatibility reasons. And so what happens in practice is that there is one directive which is parsed and ignored by the browser, which may lead to the policy being more permissive than expected by the developer. Also, another simple class of errors to catch is the class of ill-formed policies. In the second policy in this page, you can see that we have a script source directive which says that we can load the script from a.com and b.com. 
But then we have a semicolon, which uh, is normally a separator between directives, not between, uh, uh, let's say, elements of the whitelist. So in this case, c.com is not a valid source for script inclusion. It's not very clear what developers really wanted to enforce in this case. And uh, this class is very dangerous, as I said, because it means that there is a portion of the policy which is skipped by the browser. But still, this is not very pervasive in practice. Developers are at least avoid most of these uh, very naive errors. But instead, there are two classes of errors which are more interesting to my eyes and more, more pervasive in the web, which are the class of harsh policies and vulnerable policy. So a policy is uh, said harsh if it triggers a CSP violation when accessing the, the website. So we're not uh, uh, trying to do any attack on the website. We're just navigating the website. But still, the policy gives rise to policy violation. While in the case of vulnerable policies, these are policies which allow trivial script injection attacks. So for all these, pol these uh, policies, basically, it's mostly like the policy was not there at all in terms of security, because it's very, very easy to attack these policies and inject arbitrary contents into the website. So I want to discuss a bit more in detail these last two classes. And uh, I think uh, an interesting number we can find is that the 17% of the website we crawled which deployed CSP in enforcement mode, uh, policy in enforcement mode, triggered at least one CSP violation when the home page of the website is accessed by the crawler. And the crawler does nothing besides page loading, so we are not even trying to stress the website. You can still find a number of violations to CSP. And uh, you can see a breakdown of the violation in these tables. So we have uh, the use of inline scripts and inline styles. Which, uh, is, should be, which should be prevented by the policy, but still uh, it's included in the website. Use of eval or data or blob URIs, which are not quite listed in the policy. But the most widespread reason for policy violation we observed is the loading of some uh, resource over HTTP or HTTPS, which is not correctly white listed in the policy. And it turns out that uh, uh, many of these cases are actually due to redirects and advertisement system. And I'm going to present some more about this in the next slide. And what is surprising is that 75% of the websites in this, set, in this set are not actually monitoring their policies. So they may, they may not be aware of the presence of these violations on, their, on the website. Maybe some of these violations are not easy to spot for website users, but maybe other violations have a practical import, and, but they, got, they went unnoticed. As to the weakness to XSS or script injection, our goal was defining some sufficient conditions on policies which allow a, a standard web attacker, which owns, uh, let's say, a web server and a website, to inject content, active content, so scripts, whenever a content injection attack is possible against a website which is deploying CSP. Let's say the core technical element of this uh, sufficient condition is a notion of liberal whitelist. So we say that the whitelist for script inclusion is liberal if it, if it contains any of these four elements. We have star, HTTP, HTTPS, and data. Why is it defined like this? Because if in a policy I put the wildcard star, it means that any host is valid for script inclusion. So any host can provide scripts. And uh, this is similar. This is a way to say that any HTTP host can provide scripts. And this is a way to say that any HTTPS host can provide scripts. So if the attacker has a website, it will be able to inject scripts whenever there is a content injection vulnerability on the website. And finally, we put also the data, which is a way to say that uh, data URIs are, are accepted by CSP. And this is dangerous because you can use data URIs to load inline scripts just if they were XLR sources. And this is the worrisome number, in my opinion. We found that 92% of the websites we tested fail against trivial script injection attacks. Uh, you can find a breakdown of the reason for the security violation in the, in the table. The most widespread reason is the presence of unsafe in line. So most of developers are actually renouncing to security in these cases. But you can see that there is also the use of liberal whitelist in script source directive. And we have a bunch of policies which are not trying to restrict script inclusion in any way because they don't put script source directive or the full source directive. So they don't want to restrict content inclusion in any way for scripts. And this means that it is very easy to attack these websites 
even if they deploy content security policy. Coming to the last part of the talk, uh, we have performed weekly crawls of the Alexa top million over 14 weeks. And we wanted to understand whether developers are activating or deactivating CSP. So we want to understand what's the trend of the deployment of the standard. You can see in the plot, we have the red column for websites which are activating CSP and the green column for websites which are actually deactivating it. It's easy to understand that we find many more websites which are activating CSP rather than activating it. So it seems that the standard is growing in popularity. But if you want to take a more careful look 